Welcome to this edition of the 3 and 2 What's He Gonna Do podcast. I'm Dan Zielinski of the ThirdManIn.com, joined as always by Colin Cannonberg of Statswipe.com. Colin, how are you? Good, good. It's a beautiful day here in Milwaukee. Yeah, it's a pretty nice day here too, and sunny out, can't complain with all the rain we've had recently, but Brewers... Yeah. Luckily, the Brewers have a roof on that stadium, able to play, and played a really interesting game today, beat uh, the Reds 11-9, to and a game that took forever to get done. <laughs> well, when you score that many runs, uh, yeah, got to expect it. And it was wild, you know, you, you, the game started, and uh, expected it to be a one nothing shootout, or 2-1, to one, low scoring game with two of the top uh, ERA um, qualifiers coming into the game with Castillo and Davies. So it was a surprise when, when both pitchers exited the game in less than four innings. Yeah, and I mean, only four home runs, I think, hit in this game. But Davies, yeah, he had been pitching well all year. I mean, I was never sold on his early season start. But we'll see how he bounce back. Bounces back from yeah. this six runs allowed. And, and I think Davies would have stayed in the game, I think, longer. He was somewhat settling in, um, but also opted to go for a pinch hitter, try to score some runs off of Castillo. And, uh, yeah, that paid off. And uh, Keston here uh, hit his first home run at Miller Park, at least. Um, that's yeah. always encouraging. Yep. And, um, well, another another... I guess, suboptimal outing for Corbin Burns. He pitched uh, one and two-thirds innings and gave up two more earned runs with, with two walks. Um, pitched, a, pitched a clean first inning that he came out, struck out a couple, um, but then the second inning pulled again. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think um, he allowed the guys on base, and then Junior Guerra came in and allowed those guys to score, right? Um, I think that's what I saw on Twitter. Let's see. Um, what, inning, me, what inning did he come in? I think in? so. I think that was that inherited run. Yeah. I mean, but, either way, uh, Corbin Burns. Scoreless, did, either way, scoreless Cor- inning by Hader. Scoreless inning by Jeffress. Yeah, those two. Jeffress allowed three heads, got himself into some trouble, but but worked his way out of it. Yeah, exactly. I mean. Needed to get today's win after losing yesterday to Sonny Gray and the Reds. I mean, that was... Yeah, and yesterday, yesterday's was the low-scoring game. Who would have thought that, that yesterday's game would have been low-scoring? And this one ended up 9-11. to 11. Yeah, it's, yeah, well, especially with the pitching matchups, because Sonny Gray's been t- pretty bad all year. I mean... Now, I think people thought he was going to turn into something decent because he was reunited with uh, his college pitching coach, but he still is just the same old Sonny Gray. And then, yeah, he shuts down the Brewers' offense, and then they come out today against a guy who's been pitching really well, Castillo, and uh, scored some runs early on him. And I don't know. The Brewers' offense as a whole, I think, has been a disappointment. Christian Yelich obviously hasn't played the last couple of days, but they just – there's no consistency with any of their guys in their offense as when minus Yelich and he hasn't played probably five or six games this year because of injury. Yeah. I think, I mean, you look at some of the players who, who hit today. Well, um, Aaron on is three for five came up with, with a big hit. Um, he ended up him, him and Grandal had the highest win probability added on the game. Both those guys had had big hits, um, and Moose won three for five. Okay. So, I, I think. What do you think of Aaron? Uh, I know my mom is, thinks he's the best player um, the Brewers have ever had. I think, but <laughs> um, I he hit two years ago when he first came to the Brewers, and that's just been kind of okay since mm-hmm. then. Yeah, I mean, I think he's more of a solid utility guy. I don't know. He is, yeah. He's a guy on a championship-level team, perfect utility guy because he can play every position pretty much. Now, he's not the most consistent hitter, but that's also because 
he's not playing every day. So maybe if he was playing right. every day, he'd be a little bit better at the play. But I think as a utility guy, I mean, you can't ask much more of a guy who's going to hit um, around 250 and play pretty much every position and pitch on occasion when you need him to, too. So. Well, yeah, he, he could be an ace if you were given the opportunity, you know? <laughs> he has struck out a few guys in his limited pitching career, which I always think is funny when you get these position players standing up there throwing maybe 70, 80 if you're lucky, and major league hitters struggle to hit that and strike out yeah. nevertheless. So. Um, yeah, but other than that, it was – it was a good win, and um, got to keep pace with the Cubs. They had uh, Atanasio on, on the radio broadcast that I was listening to, and he was saying, uh, just giving a recap when he met with Stearns, and they say, you know, the team is the team is right where they want it to be right now. Uh, though they may not be in first place, uh, they've had the toughest schedule in all of baseball thus far, and, yeah. and are still right in the mix only a game and a half back of the Cubs and have hovered about a game and a half back. So, um, yeah, I, I think management's happy with, with where the team is. And as fans, I think I think fans are happy so far just being a game and a half back, back given the schedule and the lack of consistency in the offense and pitching. Yeah, exactly. They'll have an off day on Thursday and then start a three-game series against the Phillies over the weekend two-game interleague series in Minnesota, then on Monday and Tuesday. Kind of a big five games. Obviously, two teams that are really competitive this year, and it would be nice if they could at least go 3-2 and two in those five games. If they could go 4-1, and that would be big. But I think 3-2 and two is a manageable amount. Yeah, I'd agree. Both are, both are really good teams. Um, both atop their their mm-hmm. respective divisions too. And Minnesota's been playing really well this year. Thirty Yeah, they're 30, 32 and sixteen. That's second best that's record. Crazy. I I wouldn't have guessed that. Yeah, second best <clears throat> record in the major leagues. It's kinda I mean, I would have not guessed that. I mean I knew their division was pretty weak, but guys like Jorge Polanco are playing well. Nelson Cruz has been a decent addition for them. Jonathan Scope even hasn't been terrible for him. Pretty just kind of solid year. And guys like their pitching staff, Jose Barrios has pitched well. Mm-hmm. Even Michael Pineda is play, uh, pitching well. And Jake Odorizzi. Um, so just guys stepping up, it seems like. And that's what you need, I guess, especially – when you're trying to win guys to step up and produce, and usually that's what leads to some team success as well. Yeah, I think I call Hey Polanco has been a surprise for them. Oh, yeah. Uh, he currently is at a 2.4 war. Um, and Buxton, you know, every year you, you come out wondering if Buxton's going to finally break out to be who he, he was meant to be, and he's been hit, hitting the ball really well. Um <laughs> But started off slow on offense, but he's so valuable in the field. Yeah, such a great defender. Speaking of valuable, um, speaking of valuable in the field, what about your big guy, uh, Williams? Williams asked the deal. That guy, he, <laughs> yeah, he's, he's good. He's really good. The guy just doesn't strike out. Um, he was runner up in the Venezuelan league this winter. Uh, wow. Lost out to, uh, who was it, Delman Young? Someone <laughs> stole the MVP award from, from Williams Estadio, which you know his eyes are set on the MLB um, MVP award now. Um, it's only a matter of time. Uh, yeah, I'm, <sighs> big things are on the horizon for that guy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did you know he's been with a few different organizations? Uh, he's Signed with the Phillies, then uh, played for the Braves, and then in the Diamondbacks organizations uh, before. Yeah. The guy's bounced around a little bit, but I know you're high on him. I mean, I think he's just – I think people like him because of his appearance and 
the way he plays the game. I mean, I don't think he's anything special, but. I mean, that flow, when he, when he gets into a sprint and that, that hair is flowing, he's, he's perfect. He's just a ball player out there. He's pretty much a he's pretty much a bigger version of Hernan Perez. Yeah, only Williams never strikes out. That's true. Um, like ever, it's 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 ridiculous how like, like you can just count the amount of strikeouts in a season. Twenty fourteen was a rough year for him. He had a he had a big twenty strikeouts and. <laughs> in uh, 465 plate appearances. It's funny. On ESPN, they list his height weight at 5'9", 185 pounds. I'm like, no way he's only 185 pounds. Go to Baseball oh. Reference, and he's 225 there, and that's probably <laughs> a little bit more realistic. But um. Yeah. Oh, but it, it'd be great to see Williams in the postseason. I think everyone everyone's cheering for Williams at the studio. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Rocco Baldelli doing a good job, though, first-year manager. I haven't caught too many yeah. teams games, but he was a guy that obviously was supposed to be a great player, got hurt, battled some different things, and kind of well-regarded baseball front office manager type guy and now getting his chance. And Do you think they're having more success because the division sucks? Or do you think they're actually a decent team? I think they're actually a decent team. Um, I mean, their division being awful helps. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, again, it's. <laughs> I think everyone is kind of pumping their fists in a bit in a way that it's not Cleveland winning. And I have nothing against Cleveland, but how they were so last the days of the in their offseason, just not signing anybody, not yeah. doing anything. Probably under the assumption that they can just coast into the playoffs with a weak division. Yep. And now they're seven games back of the Twins. Good. You know, you, you like to see that. Just so maybe the front office in Cleveland thinks like, wow, we, we could have gotten a guy. Because that team's not bad. It shouldn't mm-hmm. be bad. But they did nothing in the offseason to improve it. I mean, I kind of understand where they were coming from. They didn't want to spend money. And they kind of were hoping – some of these low cost signings were gonna pay off, but like I saw they DFA'd Carlos Gonzalez for assignment. It's like who else are they gonna have play in the outfield? I mean, they just have no minus their pitching staff and like Lindor, a couple other guys, they just really don't have a lot of talent, especially in that outfield. But. Yeah, no, that's it, it's such a kipness does kipness is nothing. And Jose Ramirez has just turned bad now. Um, yeah, he sucks. Which Sam Ryan, Sam Ryan of ESPN, said in a hot take at the beginning of the season, Jose Ramirez is bad. Didn't see that coming. And and when you look into it now, um, you know his his average exit velocity is is even higher than last year. He's not doing anything different in terms of plate discipline. So I don't know why he's bad, but yikes, he, he's not doing well. No, he's not. He's been a disappointment, and I don't know if it's just because, I don't know, he just, yeah. He's not getting extra base hits especially, too, which that was what he was doing so well when he had that a lot of success a couple of years back that earned him that contract extension. But, yeah, I don't know. He just, he looks kind of lost at the plate. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, but... He went better. I, I'd expect him to get going. I, I think he's gonna. He's not gonna hit his usual high two hundred this year. Um, but I think if he can get up to two fifty, season's a success. I still think it's a disappointment. Major League Baseball forced the Indians to get rid of uh, the Chief Wahoo logo. I think that was the best oh. logo in sports. That was. Yeah, that was that was that was a great logo, and I think any fan would tell you how good of a logo that is. Exactly. I, it's sad. And Chief Wahoo. And someone who's part Native American, that didn't offend me at all, but I guess it offended some people. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, well. Do you know? 
uh, I guess in the in the season long watch of the stolen base record. Uh, well, guess how many more stolen bases the Royals have than the second place team? The second place team is the Rangers. Really? Yep, and they have thirty five stolen bases. Guess how many Kansas City has? Ninety. Nope, not quite that many. Sorry, I was going a little high. Uh, 70? No. Nope. Too high still? He's going a couple more decades down. Ah, uh, 50. Close. 47. Okay. So, they're 12, 12 up on the Rangers. Heck, Alber- Alberto Mondesi has 17 on his own already. And... Yeah. Heck, he'll probably... He might... He'll get... He'll get 40 for sure. He might get close to 60, actually, based looking on his plate appearances. And then, like, yeah. Billy Hamilton hasn't been healthy the entire year. He only has nine. Mm-hmm. Whit Merrifield's not getting on base right now as much as he has in the past. So he's got seven, but he's... Yeah. That's impressive. I mean... But the, I, I don't... <laughs> I doubt they're they're gonna beat um, the record of in 1976. I guess is uh, 341 stolen base by Oakland. Obviously, um, um, I I don't think they're gonna get to 341. No, not 50 games into the year already. But if they're, uh, I think I think they'll get over 200. Yeah, if Billy Hamilton can. Billy Hamilton's got to get to 30 stolen bases. He's at nine right now. He's got to get at least 30, 35, 40. Whit Merrifield's got to get at yeah. least 20, 25. And then, I mean, I know that's kind of why they, how they built this team was based on speed. Listening to Ned Yost and Dayton Moore speak, they want. that's why they signed Billy Hamilton when no one else really wanted him because of his speed. And they thought with the speed maybe he could – kind of change, I don't want to say the way other teams play, but just put pressure on other teams and make them be more aggressive, I guess. So we'll see how. Obviously, they're not going to be winning a division anytime soon, so people can say, well, it's not working that well. But I don't know. Yeah, Yeah, I like the stolen base. I wish more teams would steal bases. They're bad. At least they're fun to watch if they're going to be bad. Hunter Dozier on the... Royals is playing still really well. Nine home runs, 26 RBIs. Dozier is good, yeah. 303. Yeah, he's playing well. He changed his approach a bit, though, going into this season, so that looks like it's helped early on. More selective at the plate. but Right. Um, well, I, only a couple weeks away from the MLB draft. You getting ready for that? Oh, yeah. 55 draft profiles. Done. Talked to 55 guys. Followed up with, I think, I did two today. So I think I'm at, let's see, six follow-up interviews. Have most of those stories up already. We'll have the other ones up later this week. And eh, 55, I'll probably be there. Might push it up to like 57 or so. But hard to believe the draft is, uh, yeah, less than two weeks away. It's just, I don't know where these last six months, five months have gone. It just seems like it's flown by since I started interviewing these guys in December doing a few and yeah should be interesting to see how it plays out not not a loaded yeah. draft some really good players but overall the depth probably isn't as good as a f- few previous years but we'll see how it goes well we got a, a listener question asking who who do you think the, the Brewers will be choosing in their first round um, who, who do you think that's a good question because the Brewers, after having a lot of success last year, got pushed down in the draft order and aren't picking till late in the 20s, picking at pick 28. So, And the problem, too, is they got the second lowest bonus pool money, so it's not like they can take some guy who falls down. I really think right now they're going to go hitter. That's just what they've done in previous years if you read the story i did on baseball prospect journal that'll also appear shortly on the thirdmanin.com of the last 10 years of 
first round draft picks. It's been almost exclusively hitter they've gone, and if they have gone pitching, the pitcher has been a major bust. So the last couple of years, especially under this regime, they've gone hitter. So I think that's probably the route they end up going. I like Tyler Callahan. He's a third baseman, prep third baseman from Florida. Guy who probably can play second, has played second, has played short for his high school team, has experience playing first, and has played a few innings at in left field, also played a few games in catcher. But I like him. I think he's a guy, obviously, who can hit a lot, got good upside. Not going to be a great defensive player, but I think I'm – like a few teams that have interest in him as an offensive-minded catcher, I think that's where his most value would be. And I think he would be a great pick if the Brewers could get him at 28. I, I think that's smart of them to go for a hitter, too. Uh, pitchers, you're going to lose a year or two of them to Tommy John surgery at some point. Exactly. Um, may as well lose a later round pick to that and get more of a, I guess, a better chance of success there with, with a hitter. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, I think I think that would be a good pick. It's just um, it's just so hard to predict, kind of really who they're gonna pick because who knows who's gonna even still be available for them. I mean, there's some guys who you could dream on being there. Brett Beatty, a prep third baseman out of Texas, but I think he goes in the teens probably at this point. He's, Moved up draft boards. I like Gunnar Henderson, shortstop prep kid uh, from Alabama. That's really good. There's a few college guys that have some good potential as well, but like I said, it's kind of hard to just project who's going to be at 28 because so much has to happen before that point. Right. Yeah. Now hopefully, uh, hopefully they can convert Henderson into a hitter. I, I wonder what um, – I think it's something that – the Cubs have always done too, right? They've kind of went more for offense and developing offense inter- internally. Mm-hmm. And then they just acquire their pitching. You can see their pitching now. Uh, pretty much every single one has been acquired via trade or free agency. Um, so I, I think that's the best route to go as well. Um, who do you see? I, I guess, uh, who do you see as, has the highest upside. Who, who do you think is a risky pick, but could offer you and just be one of the best players in baseball? That's a good question. There's a few guys I kind of see with that. Um, one guy I guess I'll first start off with is a prep pitcher, right-handed pitcher, Daniel Espino, guy who's originally from Panama, now in Georgia. Good size, right-handed pitcher, like I said. He's got an advanced fastball. Guy who sat this spring, more mid-90s. Was kind of a little higher last summer. Um, Has even touched 100. But he's got just an advanced repertoire. And he's a guy that early on might have been the top high school pitcher in this year's draft class. But because he's got a little bit of effort to his delivery and also just the history of hard throw and right-handed prep pitchers isn't that great. He's a guy who's probably going to go late first round. He's a guy who definitely has the potential to be a really a, a big impact arm in the pros in four years, but there's a lot of variables just playing against him because of kind of a little bit of effort to his delivery and also being a hard throw and right-handed pitcher. Just the trend has not been kind of in those guys' favors. And there's a lot of those kind of right-handed prep pitchers who have high ceilings, but because they're right-handed, aren't going to be highly picked, more in the teens, 20s, second round. Another guy I like, too, is someone I already mentioned, Brett Beatty, prep third baseman from Texas. He's a guy who's probably been talked about maybe going as high as to the Rangers at 8 as an underslot deal, but more likely to go in the teens at some point. His biggest knock on him is that he's 19 years old already as a prep player. So just that being a year older, for whatever reason, scares some teams. I think they're worried that because he's a year older, it might affect his development and his uh, growth in terms of what he's able to produce. Is he more mature already? But left-handed hitter probably possesses some of the best raw power 
in this year's draft class. Guy just hits. Not great defensively. Might have to slide over to first base, but I think he can get the job done at third base, and he's a guy, like I said, who's going to hit. And another under-the-radar guy uh, is probably Shea Wanger Lears, a catcher from Baylor. Now, he's a guy that has been – he was highly regarded coming into the year, considered maybe the second-best player behind Adley Rushman, the catcher from Oregon State. Most years, Lang Hurliers would be the top catcher, but this year with Rushman, he's number two. But he's a guy who broke his – had a hand injury um, early on in the year, kind of rushed back too soon, produced kind of mediocre results. But he's a guy that defensively is elite behind the plate. I think his hitting is going to come. He's already showed better hitting this year from his sophomore year, hitting over 300 this year after hitting – lower 200s but he's a guy who might go nine to the Braves something like that but I think um, even though he's still kind of well regarded he's a guy that still has huge upside and could be one of the best players in this year's draft and like I mentioned earlier Tyler Tyler Callahan I think is gonna be a guy that might surprise some people down the road as Mm -hmm. well so yeah that will be, you mentioned this, you know, and I remember the first time uh, you mentioned him to me and I looked up his video and, like, the guy just looks intimidating. Um, yeah. He's got that factor to him. and uh, Yeah, I, I'm, I'm excited to see him pitch, I guess, more than, than any other pitcher in the draft. Yeah, it's just like, I mean, I don't know if you remember a guy named um... – Riley Pint a few years ago was like number oh, three yeah. or four overall to the Rockies. I liked him coming out of high school, but very similar to Daniel Espino. Some effort to his delivery, hard throwing right handed pitcher. He hasn't developed, uh, I think it was last year or two years ago. Ethan Hankins, another hard throwing righty. He's been just kind of so 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 far in his pro career. So it's just. The track record of right-handed pitching isn't that great on the prep side. And plus, I mean, the amount of right-handed prep pitchers you can get, it's why take a chance on a guy when you can get someone who's maybe got a little bit better delivery, maybe less risk to them and just as much upside. So um, I'll be, I think he's the biggest wild card in this year's draft. There's definitely teams that like him, but is he worth taking over Worth taking high in the draft instead of waiting maybe to the second round and grabbing a different right-handed pitcher who has maybe a little bit less risk, maybe not quite as much upside, but still decent enough upside. So. Yeah. Yeah, it should be interesting. And uh, I know in these years then that you've been doing this, I always pull up your site during the draft. I'll be keeping tabs of the draft. And uh, definitely, you know, for anyone listening – at the baseball prospect journal because it's uh it's, it's it's cool to see a player get drafted and then just go if you've written a profile on them yeah. go and kind of read about the their personal life a little bit you know who they are um, before they become known and uh, you get to know those players during the draft then by by reading your profiles so mm-hmm. yeah keep up the good work with that and um, I'll be sure to be. Uh, looking on it during the during the draft for sure thanks i appreciate that and yeah i've interviewed a lot of kind of high-end guys so a lot of guys who are going to be early round picks so definitely um when people usually pay the most attention are early on so yeah definitely yeah. Check. anyone listening check that stuff out did you see the news too about carter stewart um a guy who the Braves selected eighth overall last year right-handed yeah. pitcher and some issues over his wrist, had a wrist injury, according to the Braves, and they only wanted to offer him $2 million. He wanted $4 million, I believe, and didn't come to terms on a deal. He went Juco route this year, and he came into the year. People thought, okay, he's going to be a top-10 pick again just because he's got that much talent. And he kind of – his numbers are good, but his consistency, if you watched him, wasn't anything special. So it caused him probably – in my latest mock draft that I – posted last weekend i had him going in uh the competitive bat i don't know i had him yeah competitive balance pick 37th overall so definitely he wouldn't have even gotten two million dollars probably in signing bonus maybe 
if a team went over slot on him. But, yeah, he goes to Japan. Supposedly he's going to sign with a Japanese team. Six years, get paid over six, $7 million. So I'll be curious to see if that's kind of the route team or prospects select. I have to think Major League Baseball is going to try to find a way to stop that. But because he's the guy who goes over to Japan makes more money than he would with a signing bonus and playing in the minor leagues. And he's also going to get to free agency quicker at 25. So I don't know if that becomes a route. I mean, you still have to go play in Japan, which could be cool. But, I mean, you're also in Japan halfway across the world. So I don't know. Yeah, that's what I thought, too. A kid, he's just a kid. And, and he's, yeah. I don't see many people wanting to do that, to go across these, move away from family and, and everything, you know, that they have here at home. Uh, so it is shocking just from, from that standpoint that a kid out of college would want to spend how many years in Japan. Yeah, I mean, he's a Boris client, so I wonder how much that has to play into it, but we'll see how that goes. I don't know. I don't see it ending well, but... We'll have to see. Yeah. So. Did you? Oh, anything else? Um, anything else at all to, to bring up anymore? Did you? Did you read? Your yeah. Did you read my article yeah. about the last uh, ten years of Brewers first round picks? No, I, I I didn't get to read read the article. I saw a comment on Facebook. Someone put, "Well." Mitch Hanniger turned out, I mean, the Mariners, <laughs> but... <laughs> oh, it's bad if, you, when you read it, it's bad looking at how many guys did not pan out, and like, I mean, some of them too, like, when they drafted them, and they were kind of head-scratching picks, but some guys just didn't pan out, but then there's like, guys like Eric Arnett, like, why'd you take him, stuff like that, just guys didn't pan out, so, it's, it's, Yeah. There's a reason why the Brewers struggled for a few years there because they just had no talent. Yeah. So. Yeah, it all it does come down and a lot of teams struggle with that too. The Angels, they haven't had a first round talent work out for forever, it seems. Oh yeah, it's been Trout. Like, yeah. <laughs> I think Trout's maybe the last one to turn out. Otherwise that's why their farm system was so bad. Um and while the Royals, they have nobody within the top 100 prospects at the moment, so really? they'll be bad for a while. They've got. A, I like some of their prospects. So the recent guys they've drafted over the last two, three years, there's some guys I really like. A couple well, of Florida. They drafted half the Florida pitching staff. Yeah, I think those guys have a chance to be decent. They also got uh, uh, Nick Prado, a first baseman, a prep kid. Who I mean, first yep. base isn't a sexy position, but a guy can hit. Um, Melendez, I can't, MJ, I think Melendez, something like that. Catcher, okay. now another prep kid. Prep catcher is, is probably one of the toughest positions to come into pro ball as, but he's a guy who coaches son, and he has a chance to be really good too. So they've got some potential yeah. in that farm system. It's just a matter of can they develop it and can the guys pan out, so... I think it would have been better had Ash Russell not decided that he didn't want to play baseball anymore. He's supposedly um, making a comeback. Did you hear that? Oh, yeah. Well, that should be good. After a couple of years and a couple of years older, a couple of years without baseball, I'm I should, sure he'll do great. I should probably just dial up his number one day and see if he answers. But because um, I think that'd be <laughs> Grant. He hasn't talked to anyone about it, so but I think that'd be an interesting story. Another. So, well, yeah. I think that's going to wrap it up for this podcast. Make sure to send in your questions. We're always glad to answer those. Uh, send them either via Facebook or Twitter. And thanks again for listening to this edition of the 3 and 2 What's He Going to Do podcast. We'll be back next week to talk more Brewers and MLB Draft. Thanks again for listening.